the puppet. If for a moment God would forget that I am a rag doll and give me a scrap of life, possibly I would not say everything that I think, but I would definitely think everything that I say. I would value things not for how much they are worth but rather for what they mean. I would sleep little, dream more. I know that for each minute that we close our eyes we lose 60 seconds of light. I would walk when the others loiter, I would awaken when the others sleep. I would listen when the others speak, and how I would enjoy a good chocolate ice cream. If God would bestow on me a scrap of life, I would dress simply, I would throw myself flat under the sun, exposing not only my body but also my soul. My God, if I had a heart, I would write my hatred on ice and wait for the sun to come out. With a dream of Van Gogh I would paint on the stars a poem by Benedetti, and a song by Serret would be my serenade to the moon. With my tears I would water the roses, to feel the pain of their thorns and the incarnated kiss of their petals, my God, if I only had a scrap of life. I wouldn't let a single day go by without saying to people I love, that I love them. I would convince each woman or man that they are my favorites and I would live in love with love. I would prove to the men how mistaken they are in thinking that they no longer fall in love when they grow old not knowing that they grow old when they stop falling in love. To a child I would give wings, but I would let him learn how to fly by himself. To the old I would teach that death comes not with old age but with forgetting. I have learned so much from you men. I have learned that everybody wants to live at the top of the mountain without realizing that true happiness lies in the way we climb the slope. I have learned that when a newborn first squeezes his father's finger in his tiny fist, he has caught him forever. I have learned that a man only has the right to look down on another man when it is to help him to stand up. I have learned so many things from you, but in the end most of it will be no use because when they put me inside that suitcase, unfortunately I will be dying.
The weather have been another night of missile launches and air raids across the border. where entire neighbourhoods have been flattened. Well, both sides have accused the other of war crimes, torturing and murdering babies and children in attacks which began on Saturday. If money is God, then I will if believe that art God, is evil. You will believe that art is evil. This was a blast just a couple of hours ago, which sent black smoke billowing into the sky. A huge blast there, as you can see. Well, this is the scene live. Somewhere else. Very, very uh, hazy uh, background because the amount of smoke that's been released by these air missiles means it's very difficult to see in the distance. But you can see there uh, black smoke uh, pouring out of a broken window in a building in the foreground. A well, Hamas spokesman says at least 30 people have been killed and hundreds wounded in overnight strikes, with residential buildings, factories and mosques among the targets hit. And in the last few minutes, the Pope has come out with a statement and said he's very worried by the total siege. where soldiers say they've uncovered atrocities, including the murder of mothers and their children. They have just jihad machine to kill everybody, without weapons, without nothing, just normal citizens that want to take their breakfast, and that's all. And they kill them. It's an aggressive thing to see. It's very difficult to see it. But we must remember who is the enemy and what our mission. Our mission is the justice, we're on the right side, and all the world needs to be behind us. A world like one drawn by a child, with no algebraic equations, with no loving farewell and no force of gravity. I lost everything. My house, my shop has been destroyed completely. Where do we go? We have become homeless. <laughs> Thank you.
and just behind you can see some of the the troops in the distance some some hardware some vehicles this is a closed military zone now there's been a lot more activity in this area this morning more troops racing by in the, in their vehicles more artillery going out there is nothing to worry about uh, behind it they, they seem to be on edge there seem to be some preparations although some of the tanks which we had my colleagues had reported on earlier a line of tanks behind this tree line a lot of those that armor has moved away all signs of what is widely known to be no sense about how long that will take they may not know because this is a, an option that is ask most people what their number one fear is <clears throat> what, what do you think it is most people's number one fear is public humiliation okay. I don't give a fuck anymore mm. I'm not afraid because I've had plenty and now it's just time for me to say I'm tough because what does not kill you makes you strong जल जल एक बड़ा गिफ्ट दूंगा कि जिंदगी में सोच भी नहीं सकते Learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. Never share your secrets with anybody. It will destroy you. The difference between depression and sadness is sadness is just, you know, from happenstance. Whatever happened or didn't happen for you, or, you know, grief or whatever it is. And depression is your body saying, fuck you, I don't want to be this character anymore. I don't want to hold up this, this avatar that you've created in the world. It's too much for me. You, you should think of the word depressed as deep rest. Deep rest. Your body needs to be depressed. It needs deep rest from the character that you've been trying to play.
तुम दो रूम वाला कोई फ्लैट क्यों नहीं ले रहे हो पैसा कहाँ से आएगा बोलो तुम अपना फ्लैट बेच दो लेकिन आ, वो फ्लैट बेच के तो आधा पैसा आएगा और बाकी मुझे कौन देगा वो फ्लैट बेच के तुमको आधा पैसा मिलेगा हाँ। बाकी आधा तो मैं तुमको दूंगा ना सच में बिल्कुल तुम झूठ तो नहीं बोल रहे हो विश्वास रखो मुझ पे। जब वो फ्लैट तुम्हारे नाम पे हो जाएगा तब तो विश्वास होगा ना थैंक यू वेरी मच तुम बहुत अच्छे हो बहुत अच्छे दोस्त हो मेरा तुम्हारे लिए सब कुछ मेरी जान Nobody knows what's happening to them. On the day he had died for the first time, it would become one of the deadliest sights. Over 250 bodies have been recovered from the festival grounds and surrounding area. Here's how the attack unfolded. Just before sunrise on Saturday, the all-night rave is still in full swing. At around 6.30 a.m., concertgoers notice a barrage of rockets. Soon after, the music halts. As the rockets continue, festival organizers tell attendees to leave. Around 7 a.m., confusion turns to panic as attackers reach the festival. Many attempt to escape via dirt roads that lead to a main road, but it creates bottlenecks. Drivers encounter gunfire from multiple directions. Yo! Many, like Devorah Abraham, abandon their vehicles to take cover. Ready. 
One car makes it out and drives south, but just before 7.40 a.m., they encounter the spiders. Twenty minutes later, on the same road, more fighters are seen closer to the festival, assaulting civilians at a bomb shelter. The southern escape route is now blocked. Around 8.30 a.m., security attempts to hold off. He was in his coffin, ready to be buried, and yet he knew that he wasn't dead. That escape route is now blocked, too. Large groups make desperate attempts to flee, running across open fields. <laughs> Others remain at the grounds. <laughs> hiding in dumpsters, and seeking protection from security personnel. <laughs> Just before 9.30 a.m., Others can be seen hunting down anyone remaining on the grounds. Someone appearing to play dead moves. A fighter notices and executes them. Still remembered, the endless hours spent on that bed zone with hot needles. Moves from place to place to stay alive. <laughs> After many hours, she makes it to safety. Those who didn't escape were killed or taken hostage. <laughs> And paraded through the streets.
Buttons. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The promise of a better future had opened up in her unknown region. No one disturbed the silence, and the smell that came from the garden was a smell of fear. A living death. A real and true death. She bore the weight of darkness that fell upon her temples like molten lead, but that remembering always ended with a terror of the unknown and death begun to flow through his bones like a river of ashes. in a richly composed world of imagination, reflecting a continent's life and conflicts. Poetas y mendigos, músicos y profetas, poets and beggars, musicians and prophets, warriors and scoundrels, all creatures of that unbridled reality, we have had to ask but little of imagination, for our crucial problem has been a lack of conventional means to render our lives believable. Para ser creíble nuestra vida, este es. This, my friends, is the crux of our solitude. And recognized themselves that defined them, celebrated their passion, their intensity, their spirituality and superstition, their grand propensity for failure. By his political outlook, which was informed in part by a 1928 military massacre of banana workers striking against United Fruit Company, which later became Chiquita.
He told reporters at the time, quote, my books couldn't have been written if I weren't a journalist because all the material was taken from reality. When I was 38 years old and with four books published since I was 20, I sat down at the typewriter and began. Many years later, facing the firing squad, Colonel Orellano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. I had no idea of the meaning nor the origin of that phrase or where it was leading me. What I know today is that I did not stop writing for a single day, for 18 straight months until I finished the book. It seems incredible, but one of my most pressing problems was finding paper for the typewriter. I had the bad manners of believing that misspelled words, language mistakes, or errors in grammar were actually created, and whenever detected, I would tear up the page and throw it into the trash basket to start again. With the peace I had gained in a year of practice, I figured it would take me about six months working every morning to complete the book. Esperanza Areizia, the unforgettable para, was a typist for poets and filmmakers who completed the final versions of the great works of Mexican writers including Where the Air is Clear by Carlos Fuentes. Pedro Paramo, Juan Rulfo, and several original scripts of Luis Buñuel. When I asked her to finish the final version, the novel was a draft of riddled patches, first in black ink and then in red to avoid confusion. But that was not unusual for a woman used to being in a den of wolves. A few years later, Pera confessed to me that when she was going home with the final version of the manuscript that I had corrected, she got off the bus, slipped and fell under a torrential rain. The pages went floating in the mirror of the streets. With the help of other passengers, she was able to collect and drench the near illegible pages and took them home to dry page by page with a clothes iron. What could be the topic of an even better book would have been how we survived. Mercedes and I, with our two children, during that time when I did not gain a dime anywhere, I don't even know how Mercedes managed during those months to not miss a single day's food in the house. We resisted the temptation to take out loans with interest until we got the courage in our hearts and we started our first forays to Mount Mercy, pawn shop. <laughs> After the fleeting relief of having pawned certain small things, we had to pawn jewels that Mercedes had received from family members over time. The expert examined them with the rigor of a surgeon. He checked with his magical eyes the diamonds of the earrings, emeralds of the necklace, rubies of the rings, and in the end he returned them after a long pause. All this is pure glass. Esto es puro vidrio.
En los momentos de dificultades mayores, Mercedes hizo sus cuentas astrales. In the times of greatest difficulty, Mercedes did her astral accounting and told her patient landlord without the slightest tremor in her voice, we can pay you all together in six months. Excuse me, ma'am, replied the owner. Do you realize that this will be a huge sum? I do realize this, Mercedes said impressively, but then we'll have it all figured out, rest assured. Lo tendremos todo resuelto. Esté tranquilo. El buen licenciado, que era un alto funcionario del Estado. The good man, who was a senior official of the state and one of the most elegant and patient men that we ever met, did not tremble his voice either and responded, Very well, ma'am. Your word is all I need. And he calculated his mortal accounts and said, I await you on September 7th. La espero el 7 de septiembre. Por fin, a principios de agosto de 1966. Finally, at the beginning of August 1966, Mercedes and I went to the post office of Mexico City to send to Buenos Aires the final version of 100 Years of Solitude, a package of 590 typewritten pages, double spaced on ordinary paper, and addressed to Francisco Perúa, literary director of the South American publisher. El empleado del correo puso el paquete en la balanza, hizo sus cálculos mentales y dijo... The postal employee put the package on the scale, made his mental calculations and said, it will cost 82 pesos. Mercedes counted the bills and loose change she had left in her purse and faced reality. We only have 53. Abrimos el paquete. Lo dividimos en dos partes iguales y mandamos... We opened the package, we divided into two equal parts and sent one part to Buenos Aires, without even asking how we were going to get the money to send the rest. Only later did we realize that we had not sent the first part, but the last. Que no habíamos mandado la primera, sino la última parte. Pero antes de que consiguiéramos el dinero... But before we got the money to send it, Paco Perúa, our man in the South American publisher, eager to read the first half of the book, sent us the money we needed to send the first part. That was how we came to be born in our lives today. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a moment.
tell adoring audiences that he always wanted to be a writer. I knew that I was going to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer. I had the will, the disposition, the energy, the ability to be a writer. I was always writing. I never thought about being something else. Well, I never knew that I could make a living with this. It happened that with film, I realized that making a movie was infinitely more difficult than I thought. You shouldn't expect anything from the 21st century, he once told a group of young admirers. It is the 21st century which is expecting it all from you. He was all smiles and seemed in good spirits, but made no comments. Created a world of his own, which is a microcosmos, the committee said. In its tumultuous, bewildering, yet graphically convincing authenticity, it reflects a continent in its human riches and poverty.